Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Injecting reality into the virtual world of gaming. Later on the show, we'll take you to a video game festival that's developing digital platforms to help change the world. But first... Have you ever forgotten something? Something big? This is about your future. We're here to help them. You should think very carefully. Julia Roberts makes a run for the small screen in the new TV series Homecoming. But we start today's show by taking a look at the many faces of Andy Warhol. He once said, art is anything you can get away with, and turned an ordinary soup can he stared at for most of his life into one of the most iconic artworks of our time. We are, of course, talking about Andy Warhol. Described as the king of pop art, he once said, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. And decades after his death, he remains as one of the most recognizable and accessible artists of the last century. You could argue pop art's heyday is long gone. But for others, the artistic movement that appealed to many during the 1950s is alive and loved. Andy Warhol is probably the pop artist that comes to mind first. He'd crank out mass-produced pieces and often turn to screen prints, one of his signature styles. Warhol loved to play around with celebrity images, most famously Marilyn Monroe and Elvis. His style developed commercially and became one of the hallmarks of pop art. Images of Campbell's soup cans and Coca-Cola bottles were born from his fascination with industrial production and well-known consumer brands. All that can be seen in a retrospective exhibition of Warhol's life's work. New York's Whitney Museum of American Art is paying homage to the artist by displaying more than 350 of his pieces. Alongside his most famous creations are earlier sketches that show his inclination to capture universal themes like life and death in his art. Well, I mean, the exhibition is really very formal. So it really walks us through the early work of Warhol when he was a commercial illustrator working in the fashion industry in New York, and then through the pop work, the more revolutionary, paradigm-shifting way of making a painting, but also the work that Warhol was making after the 60s, um, and often the work that uh, people or people saw as maybe not as important, not as interesting, was not critically well received. So this exhibition is an attempt to really see the whole as much as one can with any one artist, but it's holistic. Type up online the definition of pop art and it's often explained as artwork made by objects that can be thrown away. Perhaps that's why many fans see pop art as not only a reflection of our society, but an indispensable part of it as well. So is pop art still as popular today as it was when it first emerged? To answer that and more, let's speak to art historian John Curley, who has penned a book titled Global Art and the Cold War. Thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase, John. Now, um, back in the 1950s, there was two uh, different kinds of pop art, one that emerged from the U.S. Uh, on American culture and one that emerged in the U.K. on American culture. What was the difference between the two, or was there any difference? It's a great question. I mean, I think the origins, you're precisely right to locate the origins in uh, the 1950s in both Britain and, um, and the U.S. And in Britain, uh, you really had artists like Richard Hamilton and Eduardo Palazzi who were using collage and looking at Life magazine and other American media sources um, to really investigate them. And what's really interesting about the Brit British context is that you have to think about 1950s in London. Um, um, it's after World War II. There's you know, many bomb sites still existing within the London urban fabric. There's still rationing until 1954 from World War II. Um, there's still a curfew. There's still traditional class hierarchies in place. And so the British artists looked to American visual culture as an escape from their dreary lives. And so they began to investigate this culture scientifically. And the 1950s in America, you also had artists like Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, who also used sort of media materials. Their works still looked like, you know, like art. Um, you know, still they looked, they looked handmade. They still had drips. They still had big, bold brushstrokes. 
Um, and so these are sort of the two origin points for, for pop art, but really took um, Andy Warhol and others in the 1960s to kind of bring those ideas to fruition. So you think that grim feeling uh, back in the UK at that time was one of the reasons why they didn't make pop art about their own culture? Exactly right. I mean, there's this great story where a British artist named John McHale was at, at Yale in New Haven, Connecticut, and brought back to London a giant steamer trunk full of Life magazines and other American media materials. And this became a rich, fertile ground for them to make collages, to explore American culture, um, again, as a way you know, to investigate it sort of critically, but also as a way, to, you know, as a bright, colorful escape in their, in their jury lives. Because British media was also black and white time. And America, American magazines had this, you know, bright color, giant pictures of cars and of, you know, of, um, you know, of, of like big, you know, big, bright eggs or big, bright, you know, pieces of cake. And this sort of visual culture really, um, really attracted these British artists. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone was a fan of pop art back at that time. Uh, we had art historian Canon Greenberg criticize it, saying it was very superficial. And then later, Andy Warhol came out saying he is a very superficial man. Why wasn't it loved by everyone? Great. It's a great question. I think we really, again, have to go back to the 1950s. And the art that was very popular in America, but also in Western Europe, was, you know, abstraction. The artists like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. And if anything, we could describe their works of art in one word, it'd be serious. You know, they were engaged with sort of the tradition of modernism since Picasso, but also they were more engaged with what it means to be a painter in a world after the Holocaust, after the dropping of the atomic bombs. And so what does it mean to be an artist in 1945? And so there's all this existential angst you know, around painting in the 1950s. And so many, many critics like Clement Greenberg labeled pop as superficial for precisely these reasons. You know, it didn't, it seemed frivolous, not engaged with seriousness. Um, so that was one reason. And also I think, you know, fine art, generally speaking, did not, has not, did not engage the market or, or sort of consumerism in a direct way. And art was always seen as somehow, you know, above, um, you know, uh, above consumerism, above our, you know, mundane realities. And so by pop art engaging, uh, sort of the crass consumerism of American life, but also sort of uh, rub some critics the wrong way. Art should be important, should be serious, and not, uh, not about the market. Mm -hmm. uh, now, pop art it really did become a global phenomenon, and uh, artists around the world started pursuing this as their own career as well. Uh, tell me about some of those artists around the world. Sure. I mean, I think throughout, you know, throughout uh, Western Europe, so you have artists in France like Yves Klein and Armand who use sort of uh, everyday objects, especially Armand. But like in, in Germany, perhaps one of the most famous painters living today, Gerhard Richter, um, who were trained in East Germany, moved to West Germany right before the Berlin Wall went up. But he started painting, uh, you know, copies of media photographs uh, around 1962. We largely found his voice outside of Warhol and other American pop artists. It kind of emerged at the uh, at the same time. But beyond Western Europe, I think it's interesting to consider, you know, Latin America and Asia and these other places where pop art emerged. And I think it's a little more complicated because you think about something like Coca-Cola. Um, you know, their ex global expansion throughout the 1960s. They began selling their products in Japan in 1964. And so issues of when an artist in Japan references Coca-Cola not necessarily about celebrating it or things like that, but really trying to explore issues of, you know, of cultural and economic imperialism. And so instead of, instead of sending troops over to, uh, you know, to foreign lands, America could send its consumer goods, its you know, Coca-Cola and its cars. And so especially in the age of Vietnam, where, you know, where consumerism is very much tied to American uh, international policy, Many foreign artists, you know, were thinking about very critically about America and using pop art as a way to, uh, you know, criticize and critique consumerism and American policy. So it's really interesting how, you know, in America, many people see pop art as celebrating a mass culture and consumerism. But when those same images go, you know, in a different context, they can become critical of American policies and, and ideas. Mm -hmm. But it all does come down to being influenced uh, by American culture, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so you're exactly right. And I think the, you know, this great phrase that kind of comes into being in the 1960s, coca colonization. So the idea is of, you know, the global expansion of American brands. And along with that, you know, the art, the art itself of Warhol, of Roy Lichtenstein and other American pop artists also becomes very important and influential 
and shown all over uh, all over Western Europe. So influence is both from the consumer goods, but also the artists themselves. Well, John, tell me a bit about those American uh, pop art artists in the United States. Sure. So I guess that one of the best, better known ones is Roy Lichtenstein. And his sort of signature style was to paint large scale copies of frames from comic books. So instead of having the whole comic narrative, he takes one singular frame and blows it up, you know, eight to ten feet uh, wide, and it sort of renders it on you know, on canvas. So they're quite striking images. They're quite ambiguous. Uh, but again, people label them as frivolous, just mere copies of of cartoons. John, do you think pop art is still a movement today? I think movement's probably not the right word. I think it's really embedded within the lifeblood of contemporary art. I mean, you know. You know, there are thousands of artists around the world who use media materials, who reference film stars or, you know, other kind of, you know, mass cultural references in their work. And all of those artists in some ways are descendants of Warhol, you know, and the pop artists. For example, Jeff Koons is perhaps the, you know, one of the best known artists in the world today. Um, one of his most famous works is a, you know, 12 foot high balloon, you know, stainless steel balloon animal. Um, so, you know, at children's birthday parties, clowns will, you know, shape balloons um, into animals. And he made a monumentally scaled, um, you know, version of one of these uh, balloon animals. So it's frivolous, but also it's monumental. So very much in line with, with Warhol's elevation of a Campbell soup can, mm -hmm. something monumental. All right, John Curley, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise on pop art with us. Thank you so much and uh, have a great day. She's one of Hollywood's biggest stars, best known for her roles in hits such as Pretty Women, Notting Hill, and Erin Brockovich. But now, Julia Roberts is ready to conquer the small screen. The Oscar-winning actor has just marked her first ever TV series debut as the lead in the psychological thriller Homecoming. And while we often see books turned into movies, her latest project was born out of a popular podcast. And as Zainab Gyukja tells us, the Oscar-winning actress's latest role nearly killed her. In 2018, Heidi Bergman is a caseworker at a facility called Homecoming that helps military veterans transition back into civilian life. What were your duties there? A couple of years later, she moves back to her hometown and starts working as a waitress. That's when the Department of Defense appears on her doorstep to question her about why she left. You were employed at the Homecoming Transitional Support Center? And it turns out she's just as clueless as them. Homecoming stars Julia Roberts and marks the actor's first TV series lead. I always say as a parent and as an actor and as a human that the only reason to say no all the time is that when you do say yes, it's just so delicious and encouraging and incredible and you just put your whole heart into it. Um, so I just thought it was such a great story. So interesting when I heard the podcast, I hadn't heard a podcast that was one continuous story like that before. And director Sam Ismail didn't go easy on the Oscar-winning actor, putting Roberts through what she has dubbed cardio acting. I lost two pant sizes, number one. It was because Sam had me running up and down stairs all day, every day, right? <laughs> With props, and I was sweating. And sometimes we didn't break for lunch. Girls gotta suffer for her art. But there were other challenges too. As co-star Shay Wiggum tells it, Roberts almost died for the role. And it, it, I'm not being facetious. I, we had a scene and it was on her. And we're in the middle of the scene and I'm asking about the homecoming. <clears throat> Transitional Center, and I see as I'm doing the scene with her, I see this, uh, what would you call it? Big uh, metal, four by big four. Big metal silk. Yeah. silk. It's about, the wind is blowing and, and, and it's coming down almost, it's going to come on top of her. And I just envelop, I enveloped he her. He hurled himself hurled, at me. And Knocked me to the ground. And we had, I mean, because we had to have the series go on, so. <laughs> so <laughs> That's so. a wrap, people. <laughs> I can take care of them. Too. Homecoming has received rave reviews. Critics have called it a must-watch and praised the series for balancing its haunting mystery with a frenetic sensibility that grips and doesn't let go. Yes, I am. Still to come on Showcase, reading between the lines.
Why people think this Portuguese bookstore may have been the inspiration for Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And gaming for a good cause. Video programmers in Germany come together to create a more positive world, literally and virtually. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others that ended up on Showcase's radar. An exhibition of artifacts rescued from the black market in Bulgaria has opened at Sofia's Archaeological Museum. Nearly 300 items from 19 museums all around the country are being showcased, the oldest of which dates back to ancient Rome. Officials hope the exhibition raises awareness of artifact trafficking and the threat it poses to a country's cultural heritage. Ahead of the centenary marking the end of the First World War, an installation comprised of more than 70,000 shrouded figures has been unveiled in London's Olympic Park. It's the creation of British artist Rob Hurd, who spent his last five years handcrafting the figures. Each one represents a British or Commonwealth soldier killed during the Battle of the Somme in northern France. Portuguese brothers Jose and Antonio Lello wanted to create a temple as an ode to the arts. So in 1906, they founded Lello, now considered to be one of the most beautiful bookstores in the world. Not least because of a magnificent red staircase in the middle of the shop. But in addition to being an architectural gem, it's also become a magnet for attracting fans of a certain bespeckled young wizard. Each morning at 8 a.m., people in the Portuguese city of Porto form a long queue outside 144 Carmelita Street. And they have only one reason. For Harry Potter, because the um, author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, I think she was inspired for Harry Potter, Harry, Harry Potter books here in the store. So that's why we wanted to come and see what inspired her. And all the bars surrounds this magnificent red staircase. The fans think this staircase is similar to the moving staircases of Hogwarts. Author J.K. Rowling. Author J.K. Rowling did live in Porto for two and a half years. She might have visited us, but we can't confirm that because back then she was not a public figure. She was just an English teacher living in town. The fans don't really care if the legend is true or not, or waiting for over an hour to get inside. At 9:30 a.m., the door finally opens. Bianca and her boyfriend are second in line and have the place almost to themselves. Beautiful, beautiful. It's amazing, yeah. the architecture. Unbelievable. <laughs> I can imagine that it's inspiring. Wow. And the ceiling up there yeah. is so high and I love that there's a hole here so you can see straight up to the ceiling which yeah. is super high, wow. The visitors quickly take over the 185 square meters. In the peak season, there are around 3,700 people a day. In the past few years, the city of Porto was discovered by tourists and Lelo became one of the most visited places around here. This is the picture of Lelo's grand opening in 1906. Its founders perhaps wouldn't have foreseen the kind of place it would become. As a solution to the crowds, we created a voucher system in 2015. People pay 5 euros to go inside, but this amount is deducted when they buy a book. After introducing the voucher system, our sales grew exponentially. In 2015, we sold 7,000 books. Last July only, we came close to selling 40,000. Lelo is now the top-selling bookstore in Portugal.
Lello has more than a hundred thousand books, including of course the Harry Potter collection. And some rarities are on the second floor in what they call the gem room. We have a first edition of The Little Prince signed by the author Saint Exupéry. This is probably the most unique book we have here. But it's a uniqueness that comes with a price tag of more than $17,000. Besides rare books, Lela also hosts temporary exhibitions. Currently, we have an exhibition of books illustrated by Juan Miro. This is the first time these books are in Portugal, and only the second time they left Miro Foundation in Mallorca, Spain. They are part of Miro's private collection. But both the Miro exhibition and the rare books are upstaged by the Red Staircase. I think the staircase fascinates people because of its curvilinear shape. It seems to have movement, and we have the feeling that by climbing the stairs, we're going to a magical place. And judging by all the smiles, no one here seems to disagree. Beautiful, beautiful bookstore. We're very happy that people enjoy the visit. To be able to keep this place as a bookstore that continues to sell books nowadays is really fantastic. It's fantastic. Here on Showcase, we often talk about the connection between art and politics or how art can be an agent of social change. And while some might not consider video games art, those in the gaming world would say otherwise. An independent gaming festival in Germany has found a way to use pixels to influence politics. And as Nursana Tutar tells us, their goal is to engage ordinary people and politicians on a more personal level. When you take away the financial pressures imposed by big gaming companies, you experiment more as a gamer, says the curator of this independent video games festival. And it's because of that idea that this room is now full of games that reflect today's angst-ridden political climate. For instance, the dystopian game Not Tonight depicts a post-Brexit United Kingdom where European Union citizens are denied access to some parts in the country, including some pubs, and they face constant harassment from authorities. Get Bad News is about another 21st century phenomena of so-called fake news. The game asks you to spread fake news without losing your social media followers. So, to achieve that, you have to act like a politician and make up believable lies. Putting politics aside, if you crave committing minor crimes at an urban setting and being chased by the police, you can escape into vandals after spraying graffiti on digital walls. And then there is Audley Assorted which turns you into a shrewd real estate agent and you try to sell overpriced buildings. In this game, you're a real estate agent. When you start, you will think that you need money, so you move in students. They're cheap and the flats are cheap, but they bring in a lot of cash. And as you keep playing, you'll want to make even more money, so you throw the students out and get families in, which will bring more money. It's supposed to be a bit satirical. Among all these ugly truths, there's also a positive game that promotes humanism. Symbio is a two-player game. You need to face each other while playing. And sometimes, to achieve bigger goals, you need to physically hold hands. The game detects players when they do and gives them extra points. We want to create a connection between the virtual world and the real world, and we thought this was a good way to do it. From the gaming perspective, it also makes sense to hold hands, because in the game, you hang on cliffs or edges and have tasks where you need two people. And then it's a good added experience when you also have to hold hands. This year's motto is Ready Game Change. 
create a new tomorrow. The curator of the Play 18 Festival says that the point of these games is to put things in a different perspective for players, while they send positive ones and zeros to the universe for a more loving future. And with that, we wrap up another edition of Showcase. Remember to visit our YouTube channel for more of our stories about the international art scene. From me, Efnan Hun, and the rest of the Showcase team, thanks for watching and see you next time.